some people like me go into medicine thinking, I'm just going to be a doctor. I'm going to be an intensive care doctor. And I love it, which I did. And then when you have a family and you go, oh my God, how am I going to balance the rest of my life being a mom, raising children, being a good wife with being an intensive care doctor? You don't want to put yourself in a position where you have to struggle through it. I went to work for two years as a medical director of a small HMO, a health maintenance organization, and I thought that would be heaven. It was a nine to five job. I was reviewing cases, talking to physicians, uh, nurse managers. It was very easy. I went to a lot of executive physician meetings, uh, traveled some. It was a real easy job, but I didn't like it because I was essentially working for an insurance company. Now, physician executives make a lot of money. If you're interested in business, if you're a physician and you have any training in hospital or business administration and you're interested in business, that's a great life. They don't work hard, but they get paid a lot of money because they're business people. That wasn't for me. And after two years, I decided it wasn't the NICU that was my problem. It was too many hours, that was my problem. I recommend that they find somebody in the field that they're interested in, talk to that person, ask that person about their lifestyle, about their salary, about their time, about work-life balance, whatever is important to the person who's going into medicine. All right. Thanks for joining us at the Life of a Career podcast, Susan. Before we get started, uh, can you give us a quick introduction of who you are and what you do? Uh, My name is Susan Landers, and I was a neonatologist. That's a pediatrician who takes care of sick newborns and premature infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. I practiced full-time for 34 years. Uh, while also raising three children, and I've been married for 39 years. I loved my work as a neonatologist. That's a hospital-based physician, so all the work I did was in the hospital, on call at night, attending emergency deliveries, talking to parents expecting a high-risk baby, and taking care of kids in the ICU. That's ventilators, lines, tubes, everything you think about in ICU. We use all those techniques, all that technology for babies as well. And we are saving babies as small as 500 grams, 23 and 24 weeks gestation. So it's a busy place to work. It's a very rewarding place to work. Uh, When I initially wanted to go into medicine, I wanted to be a surgeon. I uh, grew up in South Carolina. I liked biology and chemistry, and I didn't quite know where to go with that. Um, I was good at math, and so I went to Auburn University close by in Alabama. And there I discovered that I wanted to be pre-med. Now, if you're interested in a field in medicine, being pre-med, in quotes, means you're a good student. You're the best student. You study your butt off and you make all A's and you have a GPA higher than 3.6. At the time, I got into med school with a 3.67 and now the average GPA is 3.8. So you don't go into medicine unless you're bright enough to do the work. Then there's something called the Medical College Application Test, the MCAT, that you take sometime in college. And that lets medical schools know whether or not you are savvy in biology and chemistry and math. So if you're good at a pre-med curriculum, you're going to do okay on the MCAT. Now, after you go to medical school for four years, Um, Even DO school is four years these days, doctor of osteopathy. But for a doctor of medicine, it's four years of medical school and then three to five years of residency training and three to five years of fellowship training. 
I changed my mind late in medical school and decided to go into pediatrics, thinking I would do pediatric surgery. I left South Carolina, moved to Dallas, Texas, and did my uh, pediatric residency at UT Southwestern Parkland Medical Center. It was a great place to do a residency. Big city county hospitals have lots of patients, lots of poor people that love what you do, and they don't mind residents and interns taking care of them. And you get to see everything, this whole gamut of sick patients. I, after I finished in Dallas, I decided to do neonatology, and I moved to Houston, where I did a, a fellowship in, uh, at Texas Children's Hospital. And that was a busy, busy place. It's still, I think it's the second largest children's hospital in the country. It was a great place to do training. Big faculty, lots of patients, lot, uh, affiliated with a city-county hospital. And so when you decide what you want to do in medical school generally, and then you head towards a residency or fellowship, then you start thinking about where you want to practice. I stayed in Houston because I got married and had a, a few children uh, when I was a young neonatologist. Some people will choose a residency where they want to live because if you train in Seattle, for example, you get to know some of the physicians in the community and you may decide you wanted to go, go into practice in Seattle. Most physician trainees will work where they train, whether it's residency or fellowship. So if you're going to go to Chicago for your ophthalmology residency, you're probably going to end up joining a practice in Chicago. That's not always the case, but when um, students who are entering medical school and then surviving through medical school, trying to decide what they want to do, you do really need to think about where you want, might want to live for the rest of your life. So I ended up in Texas unexpectedly, but I love it. I'm what you call a nouveau Texan. Um, I didn't like the Deep South. I thought that it was very provincial. So I was really happy living in Texas. I was in Houston for seven years working for Baylor College of Medicine as an academic neonatologist. Now, in medicine, you can be in academics or in private practice. Some people want to go right into private practice, start making money right away. Others want to work for a medical school, teach, and do research. I did a little bit of both, actually. My first 13 years were in academic academics, and then my husband and I decided to leave academics, and we moved to Austin, Texas, before they had a medical school here, and I went into private practice. When you're in private practice medicine, you can work for a group, four, five, six, eight people. You can work by yourself and run a small business. You can work for a big corporation. I worked for pediatrics medical group. They um, hire and employ obstetricians, perinatologists, neonatologists, nurse practitioners all over the country. I always liked having a salary. I did not want to run a business. I didn't want to be into medicine for uh, making money and running a business. As I said, I left academics, left teaching and research, and I enjoyed private practice because it gave me more time to be with my children. It was not as difficult. You don't have to put PowerPoint slide presentations together. You don't have to write research grants. You don't have to teach med students. But you do have to do more work up on call at night because you don't have residents and students around to help you do your work. So both types of practice are fun, are exciting, are rewarding, but they're very different. Academic medicine and private practice medicine are very different. And a lot of your listeners will have heard that medicine is changing. Now, I've been retired for about five years, so I'm not in the thick of it. But even before I retired, what was happening, Eric, is that businessmen are taking over medicine. Businessmen are running big groups of physicians. Businessmen and women are running hospitals, and they're trying to make money. Business people are running insurance companies, and they're trying to make money. So the hospitals and doctors are trying to get paid for their services. 
the insurance companies are trying not to pay them for their services and make a little profit. And everything has turned into a big greed fest. And what we're seeing now in medicine is that the business people have sort of forgotten about the healthcare providers. Doctors and nurses are burned out. Um, the pandemic pushed us all over the edge. And this, and this search for profit and this search for income has left doctors and nurses in the dust, so to speak. So some of your listeners are worried about going into medicine, thinking that they may not be able to have as much autonomy, may not be able to make as much money as we used to. When it comes to the academic side versus the, the, the private practice side, um, what are the pros and cons of each side? Uh, academics uh, tend to make a little less money than those in private practice, but they have, have an easier schedule. Their residents and fellows in the hospital, seeing their patients with them and for them so they don't work as much on call at night. They're more academic. They write papers. They write research grants. They conduct research and they teach. And so you have to really know your stuff to be a teacher, to be an academic. You have to be cutting edge, read the journals, uh, keep up with information, go to meetings, present your research work. So it's not all taking care of patients. It's new information, clinical or basic research, and teaching. But you also take care of patients and you train residents and students and fellows by allowing them to help you take care of patients. So it's a little bit easier in that sense and you make a little less money, but your lifestyle is better. And if you have an academic brain and you want to seek information and make new discoveries, that's the way to go in medicine. Some people even get a medical degree and go work for the NIH. They never see patients. They only do research. And that's available too. Most people go into medicine to take care of patients. And, and that they do in private practice more easily. You make more money. You work a little harder. You may have to run your own practice, business, hire and fire, nurses and assistants. But it gives you way more autonomy. Um, I hear from private practice doctors who are in small groups and solo practices that they hate the bureaucracy of working with Medicaid and Medicare. They hate the bureaucracy of working with insurance companies. And with a medical school, that's taken care of for you, taken care of for you by people who work for the department. In a private practice, you have to do that yourself or hire somebody to do it for you. So there's more hassle in private practice. The work is a little harder. The call's a little more frequent or intense. You make a little bit more money. Um, now, there are orthopedic surgeons in academic medicine who make a lot of money, and they're very happy doing a little research and some patient care. And every specialty is a little different. So if your listeners are thinking about medicine and want to know about the differences between academic and private practice medicine, I recommend that they find somebody in the field that they're interested in, talk to that person, ask that person about their lifestyle, about their salary, about their time, about work-life balance, whatever is important to the person who's going into medicine. <clears throat> you should find somebody in your 40s, in their 40s, excuse me. Your listeners should find someone in their 40s who's, say, an obstetrician and visit with that obstetrician and say, can I follow you around? Can I shadow you in your practice for a weekend or a week? Will you talk with me about how you run your practice, what you like about it, what you don't like about it? Because we go into medical school and training in our 20s and 30s. Then we become physicians and we practice in our 40s and 50s. Most women who are listening know that they're going to have their babies in their 30s, maybe even into your 40s. But life gets different in your late 30s and 40s. Most people have a family. 
Most people don't want to be married to medicine. And so if you talk to somebody who's in their 40s, they can tell you not only how much they love the medical field they're in and how it works and the good things and bad things about it, but they can tell you about their life and whether they can have a whole, whole full life in that area. If you want to be a neurosurgeon, an academic neurosurgeon, and you're working in Atlanta in a hospital for poor people, you're probably going to work your butt off at night and maybe have some help during your research projects. And you may not have as much time with your family. So it really depends on subspecialty, specialty, location, and your age. But do not discount what else you want to do with your life. I had a young partner in his 30s. He was about 36. And he was working in our practice 50 hours a week, one night a call a week. It was the best schedule we ever had. And I thought he was really, really happy. And he came to me and he said, have you heard I've decided to leave? I go, what? Why? He said, well, I just don't have enough free time. I really like to ski. And here I am in Texas. And he moved to a smaller practice. I think it was in Idaho. Somewhere there was a ski, ski resort town. And he he was happier working in a NICU that was much less busy, had more time off. Now, I wouldn't have chosen that, but that's what he wanted. And so you have to think about the rest of your life, not just how you're going to practice medicine. Yeah, that's really great advice. I don't think that when people choose professions, they think too much about work-life balance. And it's really insightful for you to bring up the, the lifestyle aspect of it as well. I didn't think about it in my 30s. And as I said, I had three kids. My husband was a pediatric nephrologist. They don't work as hard as neonatologists. They don't take night call. They take all their call uh, by phone. And um, I worked harder than him. And luckily, when I was gone, he was taking care of our kids. So I felt good about that. We did not have to have a live-in nanny. But I didn't go into neonatology intensive care thinking, oh, I want to be a mother too and go to the school plays and watch the soccer competitions and, and have book club with my friends. I, I only thought about medicine. And that's not life. Life is generally having a partner or getting married, generally having a family, even if it's one or two kids. And generally doing other things in your life, music, art, travel, whatever. And so some people like me go into medicine thinking, I'm just going to be a doctor. I'm going to be an intensive care doctor. And I love it, which I did. And then when you have a family and you go, oh, my God, how am I going to balance the rest of my life being a mom, raising children, being a good wife with being an intensive care doctor? You don't want to put yourself in a position where you have to struggle through it. Having said that, that's what most people do. <laughs> most people will, you know, go in a direction and end up in a specialty or subspecialty. And then as they have get married, have children, have a family, then they go, oh, how do I adjust this? How do I make uh, tweaks so I can make my work-life balance? work out. That's okay too, but you will do it eventually, whether you think about it on the front end or whether you think about it when you're there. When you were talking about neonatology being busier than what your husband was doing, um, could you talk, walk us through some of the, like the day-to-day -day or specifics of why it was uh, more busy? Sure. Um, so a pediatric nephrologist sees children with chronic kidney disease. Acutely in the pediatric ICU, they may be on hemodialysis, and that takes at the bedside care, initially physician and nurse, and then run by the nurses. Or they're on chronic peritoneal dialysis at home, done by their parents. And adults can be on peritoneal dialysis as well. And so the nephrologist consults on children and manages children with chronic kidney diseases and kidney failure to take care of them until they can be transplanted. 
They don't do a lot of work at night in the hospital. They do occasionally, once or twice a year. A neonatologist, like an obstetrician, is in the hospital because that's where babies are born. Babies are born in the hospital in general. It's not, I mean, there are home births out there now, but I don't want to really talk about them today. So babies are in the hospital. Premature babies who are born to high-risk mothers are there in the hospital. You have to talk to them. You have to meet with the family, the obstetrician. You have to accept the children when they're born, two or three in the morning. It doesn't matter. Triplets on the 4th of July, that's happened to me. Whenever the kids are born, I get the patients and I'm in the hospital and me and the nurses and or my other partners, we're using ventilators, putting in lines and tubes, giving medication, stabilizing the patient. All of that happens in the hospital, doctors and nurses together. Rarely does neonatology take place by nurses alone. We are using nurse practitioners now, that's masters uh, prepared nurses, to do a lot of the tasks that neonatologists do, but not entirely. And they still have to be supervised by a physician. Lots of specialties are now incorporating PAs and nurse practitioners, but they always have to be supervised by a physician. So if your specialty like mine is a hospital-based specialty, ER medicine, obstetrics, neurosurgery, neonatology, uh, general surgery, you're, you're going to have to be in the hospital taking call. But if you're a family practitioner or an internist or a nephrologist or an ophthalmologist, you're going to be handling the call from home or triaging your patients to the person in the hospital. And it's a different level of work. And so the call is the extension of your job based on the type of patients that you care for. ER docs cannot do their specialty unless they are in the ER. Um, and, you know, we, we did a lot of telemedicine during the pandemic. Family practitioners, pediatricians, internists would see patients over Zoom. But that's not like touching a patient. And if somebody is acutely ill, you can't do anything over Zoom. Uh, now, psychiatry, ophthalmology, dermatology, the easier specialties, some are done in the hospital, some are done in the office, some over Zoom. But you don't have to necessarily see the patient. Well, you do for dermatology and ophthalmology. I guess psychiatry is the only one where you never have to lay hands on a patient. I can't think of another one. But so those are the differences. And it depends on what you like. When you go to medical school, you will actually be exposed to everything. And you will say, I hate that. I don't want to do that. And something else you'll say, oh, I really like that. That's fun. I think I might could do that. Or maybe you have a family member that's in a certain specialty and you want to inherit your dad's practice or whatever. Uh, so lots of different things determine specialty choices. But every specialty has a different set of on-call responsibilities, uh, a different amount of acute care they provide compared to chronic care or every day in the office care. Earlier, you mentioned the 50 hour work week and it being, uh, you know, easy or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. decent. Um, <clears throat> what is, what is that schedule? Like 50 hours, I think is more than what a lot of, you know, other p jobs might be. Um, so I'm curious, how is that schedule uh, what does that schedule look like? Is it 12 hour shifts plus being on call or, you know, yes. what, 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 how is it? Structured? Yes. All of the above. Um, uh, seven to five, five days a week and all day Saturday, 24 hours or seven to six, four days a week and two 12 hour shifts on the weekend or um, a whole week of nights and then you're off the whole next week. So sometimes we would work 
80 hours a week and then we'd be off for a week or six days. Sometimes we'd work 12 days in a row, five days during the week, two days on the weekend, not taking any night call, five more days, and then two night calls. So every practice does it a little bit different. And the average should be about 40 to 50 hours a week. And call, call time gets figured in to the hours that you work. And in reality, <clears throat> most people in general practice, family practice, pediatrics, um, internal medicine, probably work eight to four or eight to five, four or five days a week, and then take night call by phone. They share weekends. They may work every fourth or every third or every fifth weekend. I have to tell you that young pediatricians, women who are going into pediatrics, who have small children, have discovered that joining a practice in which they can work three days a week, 12-hour days, so that's 36 hours, and that's part-time, then they devote the other four days a week to their family. They're very happy with that schedule, but it's part-time. It's only working three days a week, three long days, but then you're out of the office. You're not at work four days. So there are lots of different ways to cut this up. And the hours depend, again, on the specialty and how much you want to work, whether or not you're married and have children. It really varies a lot. But it's it's not a even if you even if you were thinking about a family practitioner in a solo practice, he would have to be in his office five days a week or at least four. And he would have to be on call by phone the other two or three days. And he or she might have to go into the ER to see patients and maybe consult a surgeon or maybe send a mother to an obstetrician in a bigger city. And so that's way more than 40 hours a week. But on a good week, it might only be 40 and then phone calls. On a bad week, it might be 60 or 70 hours a week. It really does vary. And that's another thing about medicine. It's not like law where lawyers tell me that they have to put in so many billable hours. In medicine, yes, we bill for what we do, but it really varies throughout our work week. Okay. And is it flexible when it comes to choosing to do, you know, the part-time versus the full-time? Um, and what would you recommend someone when they're you know, when they're trying to figure out work-life balance, like how do you, how might they approach this problem set? Again, talking to somebody who's in the field, who's done it in a way that you think looks inviting is a good idea. <clears throat> you must look at um, what the practice requires, whether it's your practice or whether you're working for someone else whether you're joining a giant group and you only have to take call one night a week or one night a month. Um, if you're an obstetrician in a group of eight, you may cover the hospital every eighth weekend. If you're an obstetrician in a group of four, you'll cover labor and delivery every fourth weekend. That's a big difference. Um, so you have to think about the kind of practice you want to join, the specialty you're in, and what else you want out of your life. I had a detour in the middle of my career. I was in my mid forties. I was very unhappy in academics. I had three small children, as I mentioned, and I was working my butt off and I decided I need to get out of the NICU. I just can't stand, it was 60 hours a week on average at that time. And so I wasn't seeing enough of my family I went to work for two years as a medical director of a small HMO, a health maintenance organization. And I thought that would be heaven. It was a nine to five job. I was reviewing cases, talking to physicians, uh, nurse managers. It was very easy. I went to a lot of executive physician meetings, uh, traveled some, 
It was a real easy job, but I didn't like it because I was essentially working for an insurance company. Now, physician executives make a lot of money. If you're interested in business, if you're a physician and you have any training in hospital or business administration and you're interested in business, that's a great life. They don't work hard, but they get paid a lot of money because they're business people. That wasn't for me. And after two years, I decided it wasn't the NICU that was my problem. It was too many hours. That was my problem. So when we moved to Austin, I went back into clinical medicine in private practice neonatology, and I have no regrets about it. I joined a group where the members of the group would discuss schedules. Everybody wanted something a little different. The men who had stay-at-home moms for wives didn't mind working three night calls a week if it meant less days in the nursery. One guy liked working weekends. The rest of us wanted our weekends off. And so the practice members would sit and decide on schedules as long as the DQ was covered 24 seven. And so it really depends on, again, your specialty, what sort of practice you join, who your partners are. Your partners in medicine are like your spouse. You work with them, you're knee deep in problems, you're elbow to elbow, they cover for you, you cover for them. When you're not there, they take care of your patients and vice versa. And so it's very much like a marriage which you're, when you're in a practice. You have to learn to work together so that all of the patients get what they need and so that you as physicians have a decent life. And all of those things are flexible. All of those things can be negotiated. Um, for the two years before I retired, I was kind of burnt out and I needed to get out of the NICU. So I volunteered to go staff a labor and delivery unit at a small community hospital. They had a level two nursery. So we had some big preemies and some kids with low blood sugars a few IVs, rule out infection, simple things. But I attended deliveries and I talked to new moms about breastfeeding and safe sleep. And it was a real easy work life. I worked 35 hours a week. I took night call one night a week, maybe attended one delivery during that night. And my company considered that part time, but I still kept my benefits I still pulled a paycheck. It was downed. I think that was 75%. It was my paycheck, of course, was, was decreased to 75%. And I was able to kind of ratchet down my intense practice mind and sort of get ready for easing out into retirement. A lot of doctors end up doing that if they have maxed out, if they have burned out, if they leave academics and go into private practice, different things come up in your life. You may have an illness, your wife or partner may have an illness, your child may have an illness, and, and changes can always be made. No one is shackled to a particular practice. The good thing about having an MD degree is you can really pretty much work anywhere as long as you have good credentials, lawsuits that are settled or not, um, not found against you, no convictions, no board complaints. They're licensing boards, and yes, patients can complain about bad physicians. So I'm not saying any old body can get keep their MD license, but it's pretty easy to have an MD license in various states um, and to work in different places if you decide to change your practice location. Does that make sense? Yeah. When it comes to changing and finding and negotiating with different practices and potential partners, is when in a physician's career can they start doing that? Because it's probably not right out of residency <laughs> or right, right. out of fellowships. Um, <clears throat> when, when does that 
you know, par, when do they start having leverage and the experience to be able to do that? I think it happens at the end of residency or fellowship when you're first deciding where you want to practice. Are you going to stay in town? Are you going to join this group? Are you going to go back home and practice there? You're going to take the big job in San Francisco. So that's the first time you do it. And then most people get in their 40s, some early 50s, midlife, where they're saying, is this all there is? And either they're happy with the life they've chosen in whatever practice, or they say, I don't like this. I'm beating myself to a pulp or I chose the wrong field and they make a change then. So I think midlife for men and women, especially women, is a challenge because it's that time where you say, what's my purpose? What am I doing? What am I good at? You're old enough. You've figured out your strengths by your 40s, you figured out what you don't know and how you uh, address that. Do you go look things up or do you start lying or cheating? Or So I think people figure out who they are in their 40s and what they want. Are, do you want to make more money? Do you want to live in a better location? Do you want to sell your house and make more money? Do you want to divorce and move away? Do you want to divorce but still be able to see your children? So all of those things start to really come into sharper focus in midlife. And most folks then make changes during that part of their lives. But that's not uniform. I mean, a lot of people stay in their practices for 30 years. I was in academics for 14 years, two years working for an insurance company, and 16 years in private practice. So you can mix it up. You can do whatever you want. As long as you're a good physician and you have good credentials and a good record, you can move from city to city. There's something else in medicine, Eric, called locum tenens. Locum tenens is rent a dock. You can work as locum tenens and you can go work for a neurology practice in Nashville two days a week and work for a neurology practice in Dallas three days the next week and work for a neurology practice in Austin four days the next week and make a lot of money because what you're doing is you're filling in for people who are desperate to take some vacation time, desperate to get out of the office or they lost a partner and they, they're desperate for somebody to share the load. So locum tenens doctors are willing to go to different cities. ER docs do this quite a bit. Uh, family practitioners do this quite a bit. Um, I talked to the neurologist in Nashville who's written a book about being a locum tenens doc. And he says it's a great lifestyle. So when you're locum tenens and you live in Nashville, but you're going to work in Dallas, the practice that hires you puts you up in a hotel room. Uh, So it's not like you have to suffer while you're in Dallas four days seeing their patients. Um, And of course, you have to turn all those patients over to the doc when they come back. But that's another way to practice. It's a lot like what people hear about as uh, traveling nurses. During the pandemic, a lot of nurses were willing to move from city to city and the hospitals would uh, make their licenses be approved really quickly because, you know, you can't just move from Texas to New York in the middle of a pandemic and have a New York license for a nurse or a physician. It ha- you have to go through credentials. But that traveling nurses is a phenomenon that also happens in medicine and it's called locum tenens. Oh, that's so interesting. I'd never heard yeah. of that. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. That's a that could be a p- pretty exciting lifestyle. <laughs> well, if you're single and you like to ski or uh, hunt or hike or whatever and you don't have any responsibilities and you want to go live in a different city, sounds great. Really. I you know, a lot of people love it. Yeah. I'd love to 
segue, I think this is the perfect time to segue into what you're currently doing um, with the writing of your book and your emphasis on, um, you know, work-life balance and physicians. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Oh, I would. Thank you for asking. Uh, when I retired, I walked around thinking things were boring <laughs> and uh, thinking I need something to do. What's wrong with me? I, I had lunch with a friend who was a retired psychiatrist and she said, oh, you're just adjusting to no longer being important. And I went, oh my God, that's sad. But I was. I mean, you can't make decisions in an ICU one day and then stop working the next day and not feel it. I was 64 years old when I retired. I was tired. I needed to retire. And so I decided to write a book and I resurrected my favorite NICU babies' stories and got permission from their parents to tell their stories. And I wove into their stories which paints a picture of life in the NICU for doctors, nurses, parents. I wove into those stories my own motherhood stories, and I wrote a book called So Many Babies. And the book is my attempt to show what it's like to be a neonatologist and a career mom, full-time working mom, and raise a family. And that's no easy thing to do. Lots of career moms nowadays are struggling very much to do just that, to do everything, to have a full-time job and raise children. And the pandemic, again, brought out the worst in all of us. And working moms are struggling with burnout right now. So I started a blog. I have a website, susanlandersmd.com. I develop lots of resources for working parents on my website. I've written two ebooks available on Amazon. I wrote my memoir, which most people love when they read, although it's not a big seller. My purpose was to reassure other working parents that what they're doing is difficult and they need to take care of themselves while they do it. I think it took me about 10 years as a young mom to learn how to take care of myself, not just my patients and my children and my husband, but me too, that I mattered. And so what I'm doing right now is trying to reassure other working moms that they can take care of themselves. They can get help when they need it. They do need support. They do need their husbands to help out. And, um, when they're tired, they can take a break. So I've been working on and writing about burnout in working mothers. I'm developing an online course for working mothers. I have developed checklists and self-assessments. And some of those things I have sold, some of those things I'm just giving as free resources when I was talking with you before the recording, you said I'm an entrepreneur and actually I don't know anything about being in business or being an entrepreneur. So I've only done it grudgingly. I've discovered everything the hard way. I've taken a few courses here and there about how to produce an online course, how to hold a webinar, how to have a good blog how to uh, post on LinkedIn in a way that, you know, working people will see it and be interested. And so I've been teaching myself all of those ways of uh, interacting with others, using the best parts of social media. As a baby boomer, I have to tell you, I hate social media. I think Instagram and Facebook totally suck. All women are seeing on Instagram is fake impressions of perfection and how to do everything perfectly, and that doesn't exist. There are some people out there that are trying to help parents uh, make good parenting choices, but Gen Z, millennials and Gen Z do get every bit of their information on the internet and a lot of it from social media, and a lot of it is not correct. And I think mothers and probably fathers too are getting the wrong impression about 
how to be a working parent. And so what I'm trying to do is give them a realistic impression of how to be a working parent. There are ways to contact me on my website. I have a a page where you can actually schedule a session with me. Um, I also have a weekly newsletter. And I do those things because I want to gather an audience of people who want to do this work, any work, career, and family, and, and do it in a way that they're happy and take care of themselves and feel good about what they do as a mom and as a career person. Yeah, I think what you're pursuing or trying to uh, put out there is, is really important in today's world. I think you're absolutely right about the social media fake perfection. That is the, Mm -hmm. that is the world in which we live in now is seeing everyone's Mm. life is perfect, but underneath there's this layer of depression, (laughs) I Mm. think. Um, And anxiety. Yeah. People are really worried about how am I going to do this? How do I keep moving forward? I can't, it's too much. And I think we need to be honest and say, I mean, if you're working 60 hours a week and you have three little kids, that's too much. That's a lot. And so having been there, I feel like I'm brave enough to say the truth. I think I feel like I'm brave enough to say this is, these are the things you have to do to survive and be happy. And sometimes other millennials and Gen Zs who are influencers are not really telling the truth about what their lives are like. Or maybe it's curated truth. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but before we close this out, can you share a, a, a tip that you have for when it comes to burnout or dealing with anxiety, if you're mm. working 60 hours a day you know, or 60 hours a week, how do you balance right. that with your family? Well, um, having a support system is crucial. Whether you're married or in a partnership or just have a really great friend, talking the issues through with someone else is crucial. I did it with a psychiatrist. I had a therapist and my husband. He wasn't burned out, but he knew I was burned out and he was helpful, but he didn't really understand if I was pissed off at some obstetrician, what that was really all about, or if some baby died that I wish hadn't died and I felt responsible. He didn't, he got that, but not totally. So talking to another person is where you start. Creating a little space for yourself, taking a break, even if it's a weekend, a week, two weeks. As I said, I I ratcheted down and went to an easier nursery. I started having lunch with friends. We told stories. We laughed. I saw my psychiatrist once a week. I started exercising. My mood lifted. I got outside. I went for a walk. We have learned so much about how being outside in nature and being in sunlight is beneficial for our brains. It's like one of the biggest ways to not be depressed is to go outside in the sunlight and take walks. I mean, it's amazing. I I took better care of my sleep. There are lots of things one can do to recover from burnout, controlling your hours, taking a break, figuring out what you're going to do is the very first thing. When we assess what's going on, then we say to ourselves, I'm not inferior. It's not my problem. It's not me. It's too much being asked of me. Burnout is chronic stress that's not resolved. And we all get stress. We're all tired. We're all overworked. Or we have a bad day. Or somebody pisses us off not responding to that stress, bottling it up and just moving forward and doing the job and doing the work, whatever you do for a living, that's what makes you burned out. That's what makes you get overwhelmed and exhausted. And when you're so overwhelmed with stress that you haven't dealt with, that's burnout. You finally feel like you're not making a difference. So the only way to recover from that is to drop back take a break, get some space, assess your job, your hours, your place of work, do work for a 
boss that you hate? Does your coworker drive you crazy? All of those things matter when you're working 40 to 60 hours a week. Do you have a difficult child? Is your child special needs? Is your husband an asshole? Do you really need to think about getting a divorce? All of those things contribute to where we find ourselves when we're burned out. And so you have to drop back, look at where you are. That's why on my website, I developed a self-assessment list and a burnout checklist, and they're free, um, for people to sort of get started somewhere. Um, Talk to somebody else. Someone loves you enough to help you sort through how you got where you are if you're burned out. And someone loves you enough to help you make a plan. And if you need therapy, great, go get it because it really is helpful. I'm 100% for psychotherapy when people are burned out. It's very, very helpful. An objective psychiatrist or psychologist, even a, a counselor, social worker can be very, very helpful in sorting through what's tipping you over the edge. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, I just, I think I only wanted one and then you gave so much. <laughs> I still really Sorry. appreciate that. No, 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 it's great. I, I really appreciate you sharing. I just didn't want you to give away it your whole book. Right. right. So, no, I yeah, haven't. So, I haven't. Uh, I've got way more, way more ways to help people. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So um, I'll make sure to share uh, your website in all of our show notes, just so people can go and find it. Is there a particular uh, link to your books as well? If, if so, I'll go find them and make sure they're in the show uh, notes. Well, the eBooks are available on Amazon. If you just type in Amazon.com, Susan Landers, all my books will come up. The So Many Babies and the two eBooks. And everything else is on my website, SusanLandersMD.com. Great. Yeah, we'll make sure to share all of that. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your story, Susan, as well as providing us with all of your insights into both neonatology as well as the medical profession and advice on burnout and and (laughs) work-life balance. Oh, you're welcome, Eric. I appreciate the invitation. If you like this video and would like to see more career education content, please click like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Thanks for supporting our mission.